Welcome to the New Jersey History Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Whitfield Tanner. A friend of mine suggested that I use my middle name to sound more official. I think it sounds pretentious, but we're going to see how, what you guys think about that. I wanted to talk quickly. I thought about this before I started getting ready to film this. How many of you perform rituals? Like you perform rituals like when you wake up in the morning or before you go to bed. I think we all do, even if we're not cognizant of it. I don't mean sacrificing a virgin or, or a goat or anything like that. I mean something that you do before you do something else. For example, I noticed that since I'm filming these podcast episodes and recording them, I started doing certain things before I would start recording. Like I would take a nice bath, get put on some comfortable clothes, make a cup of coffee, drink it, read over the, the script or whatever it is. Um, I didn't print this out. I'm reading it from the computer. But it's just funny how we develop these rituals. I just thought I'd talk about that. I was wondering if anybody else does things like that. I'm sure you do. I wanted to also apologize. The episode where I read about the Devil's Tower, where I read from my classroom, was absolute rubbish. I have to, from now on, I can no longer read anything written by someone else if I don't proofread it first, which is what I did when I was reading that. When, also, when I print out stories from the internet to read, I need to make sure that the font is large enough to see so I don't sound like a third grader who's reading a book report in front of the class for the first, first time, which is what I felt like I sounded like because I couldn't see anything. I wanted to thank those of you who reached out with suggestions regarding technology issues. Instead of saying your recording is off balance or the gain on your mic is off, you're actually telling me what to do to correct the issues. So thank you for that. And special thanks to Matteo M for the video on how to film using an iPad. I'm taking the advice from that video now, except uh, I also ordered a uh, an I, a, um, I guess an iPad tripod, tripod for an iPad, because it, I'm having the, I have this up um, on a shelf, kind of aimed down if you're watching the video. If you can hear me, of course, you can't see me if you're not listening on Spotify. But you could see a little bit too much of the ceiling. So once that tripod is in, hopefully that will address any of the issues that I have regarding filming myself, not having to put a water bottle behind it and so on to hold up the iPad. Okay. Um, this episode is one of our Jersey Shore shorter episodes for the Jersey Shore towns, which we're doing this summer. And this episode on, is on Asbury Park. I'm going to preface this by saying I don't go all the way into Asbury Park. I really don't go past the 1950s in this episode. If you want me to do a second one, I can do that. But I really talked about Asbury Park a lot in the, the last full-length episode about the riots because I went back and talked a little bit. This is really more about the, the beginnings of Asbury Park. And if you hear whining, that's not, I'm not whining. It's my dog. He's right here because he's very, very needy. He's a pit bull. So, of course, needy. From um, Daniel Wolf's book, Fourth of July, Asbury Park, I've read from this book before. This is the history of a place that never existed. This is the history of the promised land. There's a city called Asbury Park, a place on the Jersey Shore occupied by real people where actual buildings stand in various stages of decrepitude and renewal, where the Atlantic Ocean breaks on the sand. Wolf goes on in his chapter, 4th of July, 1870, a burnt-out middle-aged businessman is walking down Broadway. Day in, day out, for more than a decade, he's run a brush factory. Hairbrushes, horse brushes, paint brushes, scrub brushes. The business which he started from scratch, has made him rich and has taken its toll both physically and spiritually. He's just turned 40, is married but childless. Self-made, he wonders why he worked so hard and sacrificed so much. Even his deep Methodist faith doesn't seem able to sustain him. Coming up Broadway, he notices a fellow Methodist and the two men stop to chat. The friend is the treasurer of a brand new real estate venture on the Jersey Shore. The businessman asks how it's going, and his friend is all optimism. Well, very well. In fact, if he puts his name down now, early, he can have his choice of building lots at a special price. James Bradley bought 500 acres of oceanfront, pro oceanfront property in 1871 for roughly $90,000, which is about one and a half to $1.75 million in today's money. He named his new town after Francis Asbury, the first American bishop of the Methodist Episcopal Church. 
Being a zealous convert to the Methodist Church, Bradley took a page from the book of Ocean Grove, a tent community, and made Asbury a dry town. Bradley had a boardwalk built, along with a pavilion and a pier, and then opened the town up to tourists and businessmen alike. For ease of organization, being a short episode, I'll break down this segment on New Jersey Shore towns on Asbury into decades, starting with the 1890s. 1890s, go back a year or two. 1888, Ernest Schnitzer built the Palace Merry-Go-Round, which would later become Palace Amusements. Also in the 1890s, Victorian-inspired homes began to be built in Asbury, specifically or especially around the lake. The Baby Parade was held every summer where mothers would promenade their toddlers up and down, promenade, I think is the right word there, their toddlers up and down the boardwalk dressed in their finest or in costumes. I was watching a film clip on YouTube, which I did put under um, playlists on my YouTube channel. If you if you listen to the Race Riots episode uh, 1970 from last week, I talked about how Many African American people were in service. They they worked in service jobs in Asbury Park at the hotels. Um, I'm looking at the baby parade on the clips again, which which you can find it on YouTube. Just type in Asbury Park baby parade, it'll come up. And everybody was white, and yet such a significant amount, a uh, number of the citizens were African American. Then I saw a black lady uh, dressed in full domestic attire, like she looked like she walked out of Downton Abbey complete domestic servant uniform holding a toddler's hand and she walked the 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 child down the boardwalk with with the others and I guess the the um woman's employer didn't realize that Mr. Bradley who, who had established Asbury Park his desire was to not have what he called ethnics in the promenade areas even if they were in service later on as Asbury Park developed when entertainers would come and work, like in the band shell and places like that, Bradley did not want anyone of color, I guess we would say today, in public places like that. I guess you were supposed to be seen and not heard. So you you do see, if you watch that episode, um, that video video clip on the the baby parade, if you watch one that, that I linked, you'll see if you watch it, a black lady, again, full domestic uniform, you can't miss her, and she's walking the baby I guess maybe she's bringing the, her um, her employer's child. Maybe the mother is there as well. 1900s, John Philip Sousa, also known as the March King, was a frequent entertainer in Asbury Park. Sousa was often critical of the new ragtime music and of jazz, which he thought was but a flash in the pan. I like a Sousa March. If you're not, if you don't know, if you don't know what the Sousa Marches are, I suggest you listen to them. They're pretty uh, fun. Fun fact, because we do a lot of fun facts, and this is the truth. I often listen to Sousa marches when I work out. That is a Sousa march. 1917, April 4th. I'm sorry, no, April 1917. I'm looking at the number four. Four blocks of Asbury Park burned when the swimming pool complex caught on fire, apparently due to faulty wiring. Winds coming off the ocean aided the conflagration as it spread inland. There's also a video link to that on my YouTube channel. And those are not my videos. I find them and, and I put them in the playlist for everybody. I will have my own videos coming soon as I get this going. I'll have more time in the summer to devote to that. 1920s, going through Asbury Park's history, the Berkeley Carteret Hotel was built, bringing more luxury to Asbury Park. The Berkeley Carteret, think New Jersey history, for whom was the hotel named? Berkeley Carteret. Think colonial New Jersey history. If you said Logan Berkeley and Shaquanda Carteret, you are wrong. If you said Lord John Berkeley and Sir George Carteret, you are amazing. You remember that Lord John Berkeley and Sir George Carteret were friends of the Duke of York, brother of King Charles II, and when the English invaded Dutch New Netherlands in 1664, took it over, the Duke of York gave the southern part of New Netherland, now called New York, to his friends, Berkeley and Carteret, and it was 
divided into East and West Jersey. We'll talk about that, I'm sure, in some later podcast episode. Another fun fact, I'm loaded with fun facts. When I was in high school, St. Rose, where I went in Belmar, we had our senior prom, I think our junior and senior proms at the Berkeley and Carteret Hotel. The building is still there. Also in the 1920s, the Paramount Theater was built. The Paramount Theater uh, brought many stars from that time um, to its grand opening. I think they even said the Marx Brothers were there. Also in the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan came to Asbury Park. As the Invisible Empire grew in numbers across the nation, the Klan began to spread even north, even further north, which many of you have, all, many of you already knew if you are a fan of New Jersey history. If you would just um, indulge me for a minute as I find another page in Daniel Wolf's Asbury Park book. In 1924, the new Imperial Wizard H.W. Evans proudly declared, quote, the Klan is Protestantism personified, Protestantism and what the Klan called 100% Americanism, Evans explained, spring from the same racial qualities and each is part of our group mind. One historian estimates that during this period, as many as 40,000 fundamentalist ministers joined the Klan. So these are religious people. The Jersey Shore was no exception. The senior bishop and president of the Ocean Grove camp meeting invited District Klegel, Bell, and his wife to speak at a Sunday school. According to the paper, an exceptionally large audience came out to the Grove's famous auditorium listened to the Bells speak on the goals and values of the Ku Klux Klan and responded with frequent applause. Klegel is a, Klegel Bell, Klegel is not his name, Klegel is a position, I think it's like a local leader in the Klan, or at least it was anyway. I mentioned H.W. Evans, Camp Evans was a place in Wall Township where the Klan would often have some of their, I guess, summer meetings. I don't think they call it Camp Evans anymore. And if you know more about that, feel free to let me know. So yes, the Ku Klux Klan came to Asbury Park by the 1920s. The Klan by the 1920s had moved on from targeting only black people. They still targeted black people, but they became more equal opportunity hate mongers. They added Jews, foreigners, Catholics, and communists to their list of those who should not breathe. And later, of course, they'd add, for example, today Muslims, gays, and others as well. I guess if you give the Klan credit, you could say they're at least consistent. They consistently hate more and more people as time goes on. A side note, does anyone ever think about groups like the Ku Klux Klan and laugh? Not, not that what they do is funny, but I think of how clownish some of their actions and behaviors are like actually what they believe. It's like, it's like if you speak to like a toddler, like let's say like a three-year-old, and they think they're SpongeBob, and they're talking to you like they're SpongeBob, and you're like, that makes no sense. You're not SpongeBob. They're like, yes, I am. I'm SpongeBob. If that's like talking to a clan person, I'd imagine. They make... No sense, but they're so insistent. It's like talking to a toddler, I would imagine. Not that I've talked to many clan people, but I'm just, th- I'm imagining that, like, they respond with such idiocy that you'd have to laugh at them because it's like, oh, you cute little thing. You really do believe that. You, re- you really are that ridiculous. Anyway, 1930s, 1920s lead to the 1930s, of course. You may know, 1934, the SS Morrow Castle caught fire. I read a story about that the other night, and it ran aground after hitting, I guess, a sandbar. Videos linked on the YouTube channel as well for that. The Great Depression hit Asbury Park, and the Grand Resorts era was coming to an end by the 1930s. Stop it. By the 1940s, excuse me, my dog is being annoying. The Yankees held, I didn't know this, the Yankees held their training, spring training in Asbury in 1943. And by 1943, because that Grand Resort era was coming to an end, more and more day trippers and weekend visitors were visiting Asbury Park. And by the 1950s, with the growth of nearby towns in Monmouth and Ocean Counties, People like moving down from up north, from New York, coming via the parkway, um, the turnpike living down here. Uh, You saw people going to Asbury Park for a day, for a weekend to the nightclubs. My grandparents used to go there to the nightclubs. Kids would go on their boardwalk, on the boardwalk. Teenagers, 1950s and 60s, you saw rock and roll taking, um, I guess you could say, front center stage in Asbury Park as, as as time went on. I'm not going to talk much about that because we could do a whole nother episode on that. But rock and roll music brought a new vibe to Asbury Park as more teens and young people were drawn to the boardwalk and the beachfront. Teenagers by the 1960s, a lot of them had their own cars. They would drive around, listen to their music. They would go to shows there. I'm not going to be talking about places or venues like the Stone Pony because if you know about Asbury Park, you know about that. And 
I'm certainly not going to talk about Bruce Springsteen because whereas he's a great entertainer when he's singing, um, he's not so great when he's talking about things sometimes. That's just my opinion. But if you would like a follow-up episode, episode on Asbury Park, I will gladly go further into the 1960s when my dog is not being needy. So please email me if you have any questions or suggestions. As always, njhistorypodcast at gmail.com and follow me on Instagram, njhistorypodcast, and on Facebook, Kyle Banner, in parentheses, the New Jersey History Podcast. Subscribe to my YouTube channel of the New Jersey History Podcast, and I've got those playlists up there. Please, I always like feedback, and let me just, if I can, I feel like I'm important in holding the microphone. Can I show you what I'm dealing with here? <laughs>